Jimbo Fisher, Texas A&M's head coach. And uh, we did a little research, Coach. We found out that you played quarterback in college. At, at, uh, was that Division Three or Division Two or 1AA? Uh, give me an idea of I how good you were. Sa- Salem College. We were Salem College and uh, with Coach Bowden's son, Terry Bowden. Had some real good – went to the national playoffs two years. Like the, it was actually NAIA 1, which is like Division Two, And then uh, he transferred he, – he changed and went to – Sanford University and got me to transfer with him and I finished up at Sanford University with him. How good a quarterback were you? Oh, uh, we did all right. <laughs> we did all right. We threw it around a little bit, made some plays, won some games. We did okay. Were you the Division Three player of the year? Yes. Wow. Yes. Look at you. Look at you. Who plays the who plays quarterback now in the NFL the way you played in college? Oh. Huh. That's a great that's a great analogy. Because I was a shorter guy, 5'9", and you don't say, in the, in the, I guess it'd be a, a Russell Wilson type thing. We <laughs> threw it, but could run, was agile. I mean, because you had to, you had to create. But uh, we threw it a bunch. We threw it a bunch back then, you know, for, for that time, that day and time. You know, you didn't spread out and have all the shotgun and all the things you did then. But had to create with your legs, ran, mixed around a little quarterback running option at times. But uh, from a size standpoint like that, when I grew up, when I grew up, Doug Flutie and I, no, you wasn't no Doug Flutie, but we were the same size. That's kind of. You scrambled. You had to run around to find lanes to throw. <laughs> you couldn't see back there all the time. Yeah, Flutie, I thought, was one of the more underrated quarterbacks, uh, certainly college oh, quarterbacks, Lord. had ever played the game. One of the most dynamic guys and probably affected his team and what he did and what he did at BC and got win a Heisman at his, his size and the games he won, the teams he led. He was, I mean, what a phenomenal, phenomenal player he was. All right, you walk off the private jet. You got the band blaring, the trumpets sounding. Uh, what was that feeling like <laughs> as you as you landed at uh, AM? It was a great feeling. I mean, very, very hospitable. People here are phenomenal. Uh, extremely nice, extremely polite, and, and very classy. Uh, excellent. And then uh, just have been, you know, embraced very warmly. And uh, then at the back of my mind, thinking, okay, we got to get this thing going and we got to win some games. <laughs> How long you, had you been thinking about this? Uh, I wasn't right at the end. I mean, they're right at the very end. That, and, you know, the last week when they called and then called my representation to do it, and it, you know, really caught me off guard a little bit. You know, had no plans on on anything like that happening, and uh, there wasn't wasn't very long at all. If the money was the same, would you still have taken A and M? Uh, very possibly, yes. I mean, you know, you don't like to move. But sometimes it is, and it's inevitable that changes are made in life, and God puts things in front of you for a reason. I was very happy where I was, loved where I was, and everything else. And there's some resources. It's an untapped potential, and you've got a great recruiting base. And I had a great – and then not that I didn't have a great relationship. Our threat president, AD, we had a very good relationship. And I've known Scott Woodward. He was at LSU when we flipped that thing down there with, with Coach Saban, and I knew his commitment to doing things. He was at Washington, and they were able to turn that thing around and, and the direction they're going, and it was, it was a great challenge be able to come down here and, and it's something I just want to be a part of. But it feels like there was, uh, there, there's still, I don't know, exposed feelings here, harder feelings with leaving Florida State or what happened, didn't happen. Uh, explain that to no. me. No. I mean, feelings, I guess anytime you leave, but the president asked me on Friday if I, I was going to make it to coach the game, make a decision on Saturday night, Sunday morning, what our future was, because I only had about it, you know, I had been contacted her in that week that that was a possibility. And he, and the president asked me to make a decision on Friday, which I did. About He called me, and so I went over to his office around 1130, 12 is somewhere in that range, and we sit down and talk, and I, and I say, you know, I, you know, make a decision for the betterment of the team, and, and I said, we'll go keep it completely quiet between you and I, and then I'll have a team meeting at 2 o'clock and tell our players, and, okay. uh, which is always the toughest by far and what we were doing. And so I had a team meeting at 2 o'clock, but I guess about 10 minutes before, somehow, I, I'd never say anything, it, it I'll have no idea how it got out because the only people who talked was he and I mm. that even knew. And uh, about 10 minutes before it did, but they were, the kids were already in the meeting room and I walked in the meeting room and, and told them. And it was extremely hard, very tough. Uh, had no plans of ever doing it. I had, I was, I had already done a game plan. and We had worked all week and had rescheduled ULM to be a game. I mean, you know, you, you, wouldn't, have, you wouldn't have done that. So there was no inclination of going anywhere. And so I walked in at 2 o'clock and had to tell our team and it was a very, very tough and that was on it was tough on me because I love those kids and I always have. And uh, but you know they understood and I've had a million of them tweet me and kind of call me since I've been here and totally understand and that we still have communication on things. And uh, but it, it's extremely tough. He's Jimbo Fisher, Texas A and M head coach. You said it was a no brainer to go to A and M. Why? Well, as I, as I said back in the end when I started the re- 
about after I got here with, you know, with Scott Woodward, the commitment they're having here, the, the resources which they have here and the recruiting base they have here. And, you know, there were some opportunities here that it just, like you say, for the betterment of everything from your family to everything. I have tremendous respect and love for Florida State. Always have. I was a Florida State fan growing up. And, uh, but the commitment and the relationship he and I had and the vision in which they had for what the future they want to be. And, you know, you want to be one of the first guys to be able to help them go do that. What are you doing today? On the road recruiting. <laughs> what town? Uh, right now I'm heading towards Houston. You know, it's, 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 it's weird when you, like, it's a whole new area for you. How often did you recruit in Texas when you're at Florida State? Well, no, but I was at LSU. I recruited over here when I was at LSU. Okay. Coach. And I've been in the area. We always had a lot of Texas players, and we recruited Texas. Last year we recruited, and we signed Marvin Wilson, the number one defensive tackle in the country out of Houston. So now areas now, you know, we're in such a global world and a national world. Kids are going everywhere, and, it, and you go look at players. It's not the regional world where everybody just comes from Florida or Texas players stay in Texas. Everybody's going everywhere. So as a coach, you're, you know, you've recruited almost every state in the United States. When you really look, you go down and break a roster down on most schools. You're up and down East Coast, West Coast, South, North, everywhere. So we all have relationships all the way across. What'd you think of uh, people responding to you throwing out the Christmas tree when you left Florida State? Well, what that was, I had no idea. The, the guys who come to put my Christmas tree up that week said they got it out. I said, Coach, it's broke. What happened? It was broke, so I put a new one up. And he said, so we'll, have, we'll get rid of the other one. Okay, so they set it on the curb for, the, for, for it to be picked up. That was what it was. There was a new Christmas tree in my house. It's still in my house. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's exactly what that guy. I didn't throw it out. I didn't throw it out. I was actually at work. I had a, there was a group who comes in and, and puts the lights and everything across the house because I'm never there. You know, you're always on road recruiting. We had a group, Espositos, who comes in and does it. And they called me and said, Jim, this, this thing's over 10 years old and it's broke up. So I said, you need a new one. So I said, okay, put a new one up. So they put a new one up and set the other one on the curb. <laughs> That's uh, what, the story behind that. Uh, what are you going to do? I didn't with, throw it out. What are you going to do with all your Florida State gear? I'm sure there'll be family and friends. I'll keep some of it, and there'll be family and friends that uh, that uh, for for memorabilia, and there'll be family and friends and people who will you know that are there that I'll give it to. Well, good luck with uh, the mission there. You got ten years, so I'm expecting at least one national title in ten years there, Jimbo. Well, me too. Only <laughs> only one. Uh, we'll see. I don't ever plan on one. Plan on a bunch. All right. We'll see. The uh, safe travels. Thanks for joining us, Coach. For more Dan Patrick Show, tune to Audience Channel 239 on DirecTV or download the Dan Patrick Show app.